in the Kali Yuga world, <clears throat> probably everybody, at least gringos who graduated high school and wanted to go to college, had to take an SAT. How many people had to take an SAT? <laughs> Just, oh, okay. Quite a lot. You're lucky if you didn't. Uh, for them, it means scholastic aptitude test. But for us, we have two different tests. Two SATs that we have to take if you're a Sat Yogi, and you have to take them simultaneously. It's a real drag. I'll, I'll tell you why. You have to simultaneously complete Shakti's aptitude test and Shiva's aptitude test. The problem is they require two different kinds of aptitude. What is aptitude? Who knows what aptitude means? Predisposition, ability, hmm? ability predisposition, capacity. Capacity. All right. To be apt for something means that you have been appropriately trained and you are appropriately sensitive and appropriately able to express yourself in the discourse of that particular discipline. Okay. So you need to be able to uh, speak the lingo of Shakti and at the same time be comfortable with the silence of Shiva. And this creates a paradoxical uh, situation because you are taking both tests simultaneously and the same answer has to suit both. And that means you are tied by two different ropes it's not an alternation that, okay, I'll answer a question on this one and then I'll go to that one and this one and that one. That's what most people do. So yogis can't do that. Therefore, they must find an answer that paradoxically suits both tests, which have completely opposite value systems and types of aptitudes. This is Bhagavad Parvat, the mountain of God. Although it's a dancing landscape, we all have to climb this mountain. The dance is that it's very hard to recognize when you're on the mountain and what is the correct step to take to go up the mountain. Because the trails always seem to be changing. And sometimes people put signs in the wrong places to actually get you off trail and lost. Tricky. It's not an easy test to pass. Now, <clears throat> before I explain this, I have to explain the El Cid theory of egoic development. Does everybody know who El Cid was? In history? Yes. Yes? Who said yes? yes. Who was El Cid? He started the Spanish um, legend of Europe. No, he was real. He was historically real. Yeah. And, and what position did he have? Uh, he was uh, a nobleman. A what? A nobleman. He was a general, actually. He wasn't really a nobleman, but he was the general of the army, or he was a minor nobleman. And he won a bunch of wars for Castile. And, uh, and he was uh, riding very high. He had a very high reputation. And they began calling him El Cid, which means? Oh, I don't remember. Ah. It means the Lord. Now, this title went to his head. And uh, as soon as his boss, who was the king, I think it was Alfredo or something like that, he got um, overthrown and, and the king's brother came into power. The king's brother didn't like El Cid very much. And uh, he lost his position as general very quickly because he had too much power for his position. He was a threat to the new king and the boss fired him and he was exiled from the kingdom. And that was the end of El Cid. Now he hired himself out for other kingdoms because they did that in those days. 
and uh, and he worked for a few other uh, kingdoms. Sometimes he fought against the Muslims, sometimes he fought for them. He didn't really care. He was a kind of a mercenary. And uh, they had those in those days, not just now. So the reason why I'm uh, using that because the ego takes itself to be El Cid. It thinks it's the Lord in its own game and that it makes the rules of its own game. And it doesn't realize that it's actually a playing game that it doesn't know the rules of. What it stands for is that the ego loves contact interruption devices. That's how the ego maintains its power. It interrupts contact at certain strategic moments in order to achieve certain ends that turn out to be manipulative or ulterior and even though they may be unconscious, they will be a product of using others as objects. <clears throat> One could even take it further and say the ego lives as uh, a set of contact interruption devices. That's really all the ego is. And that set of devices creates its own strategy. It, it produces, it self-organizes in accord with its uh, intentions depending on where it is on the mountain of God. Now, in its first stage, it is simply false, which is an anagram for feelings attuned to the lack of self. Empathy. In the early stages of the game, uh, there is a great deal of self-hatred that is actually motivating the ego to become the Lord. The Lordship is a compensation for its feeling of inadequacy. And it desperately tries to overcompensate through creating a narcissistic uh, illusion of grandeur. And this is where the uh, ego begins to create some very bad karma, but remains in its narcissistic bubble and can avoid the consequences for a while. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, mostly this uh, state, let's see, it will be uh, to compensate for the really unbearable feelings that are in the stage one here of, uh, of dread and angst and uh, the interruption is then uh, developed by the compensation of greed and then lust and then the urge to dominate. And obviously, all of these intentions break contact with the other. And they come out of a kind of ruthlessness of the ego, with very primitive feelings uh, that uh, are of vengeance and of projections of self-hatred on the other and of condescension and of uh, paranoia. Uh, and it's made up of a whole brew of such emotional states. Okay, if we can get past that, 
it can become uh, semi-pure. It will then get into the semi-pure state, which stands for sensory, emotional, mental, and imaginary production of unconscious relational enmeshment. in which the relationships that it gets into are uh, grounded in karma and they're grounded in the body identification and in the uh, illusion of needs and the illusion of uh, the, the possibility of possessing another and controlling and of uh, making the other belong to one and giving one the illusion of wholeness. And if one graduates from the semi-pure state, then one becomes true. Which is the Transcendental realization of unity as emptiness. And that brings to an end relationality proper or improper, but relationality within the dualistic frame of reference. So this um, trajectory uh, spells out uh, the, uh, the lineaments of Shakti's aptitude test. Okay, and it is the test to see whether you can get from one to four, or from I one to the I thou uh, state. And <clears throat> this relationality test is valid so long as your consciousness considers itself a being in a world. If you are a being in a world, then you need to relate to others in that world with truthfulness, with love, with compassion, with gratitude, with open-heartedness, with mutuality. And when you have uh, gained that ethical capacity and consistency, Shakti will say, okay, you passed the test. And you can get to the summit of the mountain of God. But that's only half the test. <laughs>